Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. And um, for those streaming online, that goes out to you, Carrie. Thank you very much. Um, before I kick off, a little personal anecdote. Alistair mentioned mistakes in laboratories, and I remember talking to Alistair about running gels. I said, whatever you do, Al, make sure you get the currents and the right thing. You know, red to black heart attack, etc." And he said, Ed, who'd be so damn stupid as to run a gel backwards? I said, oh, well, you're not a real molecular biologist until you run your first gel backwards. <laughs> that afternoon, that afternoon, my friends, Alistair became a molecular biologist. <laughs> Proudest moment of my life. Okay, so as Alistair said, I'm going to talk about a fairly unorthodox pathway into plant pathology. Please, if you have any questions, queries, stop me at any time. We'll keep this casual and I'll try to keep on time. First of all, I'm going to preface this by a quote from Henry David Thoreau. I should not talk so much about myself if there were anybody else whom I knew as well. So I guess this is a very personal story. It's my story, but it'll also have a bit of plant pathology along the way. Okay, what did you guys do on your 14th birthday? Anyone think of what they were doing on their 14th birthday? Please, Carolyn. Memorable experience. She broke her toe for those at home who didn't hear that. Oh, look out, I've missed a slide. Oh dear, it hasn't come over. I was planting sugarcane. I was planting sugarcane on my father's farm. And I remember that well because all my mates were at the beach having fun in the hot October days and I was there planting sugarcane. I worked at school, I didn't know what to do. Eventually, um, I asked a mentor of mine, Dave Briscoe, who is a professor of zoology and genetics at Macquarie University, what he thought I should do. And he said, come to Macquarie Uni, where I studied a Bachelor of Science. I see Steve Bradford's in the room. I met Steve Bradford at Macquarie and just ran into him this morning as I was waiting to give the talk. So welcome as, your, as well, Stephen. When I was at Macquarie Uni in 1995, I started writing to a girl in Ireland. She came from Skibbereen. Skibbereen, if you don't know, was the human epicentre of the famine, the Gore to Moor. That's where the potato blight, Phytophthora infestans, moved into the country and basically wiped out the potatoes. The Irish farmers were offloading food to England, oats, barley, corn, etc. But they weren't allowed to eat those things and they could only live off potatoes. And so about a million people starved and a million and a half emigrated. And so I had no idea what Skibbereen was at that stage, but I started writing to this girl in Skibbereen. In my third year, just to introduce a bit of plant pathology into it, I studied invertebrate zoology, microbial ecology, evolutionary genetics, biology of insects, biostats, molecular biology, and marine and freshwater vertebrates. As you can see, very plant-focused individual. What about my honours? At Macquarie, you used to do two research topics. We did a literature review. I did mine on bacterial communication and the evolutionary role of growth in asexual lineages. Then we had to do two research projects. I did mine on velvet worm hybrid zone population dynamics. For those of you who are interested, this here is a velvet worm. And for those who are quick counters, nominate how many legs it's got. Okay, I did my second honours project on lichen systematics. Anyone got the number of legs on that velvet worm? 30? 28, 28. Excellent. Almost all Australian velvet worms have 30 legs or 15 pairs. But when they're in a hybrid zone, we have genetically disparate populations, you get differences in segmentation number. So this one has 14. This is my nature paper. It's 20 years in the making, hasn't been published yet, but I assure you it's very interesting research. <laughs> Here's our velvet worm, Euperpetoides rowley, very pretty little fella. And there's my lichens. Again, not much plant pathology. But equipped with this knowledge and earning a first class honours from Macquarie University, missing out on the university medal by one point, I should not have chosen asexual evolutionary dynamics. I don't think I understood the topic, let alone my poor examiners. What do I do? I go from Harvard. Google Maps actually come up to the Harvard Hotel. I don't know why. I grew up three doors down from there. Harvard Island, so island in the Clarence River where my father has a cane farm. I drove all the way out to Moree to pick cotton. Now I can assure you there's few enough occupations in your life that you can sit down on your bum for about 16 hours a day, pushing two levers and get paid for it. So I was in a module builder. I moved one lever forward and one lever down. During that time, as the sun rises over the hills, uh, plains of Moree, and it sets and the stars arc and wheel, I could reflect on evolution. And I think 
I came out of Moree with a better understanding of evolution than when I went to Moree. And that's just through hours and hours, months of work, just sitting down pushing two levers. I'd definitely recommend it to anyone. Then I had the great joy of driving a tractor from Moree down to Trangy. It took two days. If anyone's interested in Banjo Patterson, who's Australia's best poet, he wrote a lovely poem called Come By Chance. Well, I went by chance, past Come By Chance, as I was driving this tractor with module builders down to pick cotton at Trangy. During that period, my, one of my honours supervisors let me know that there was a PhD scholarship going in a sugarcane disease. This sugarcane disease was called return stunting disease. And I remember the very first time I heard return stunting disease mentioned. I was planting cane in an October, and my brother, who was one, on one of the roguing gangs looking for diseases in sugarcane, he mentioned this disease that had no symptoms at all, but caused significant yield loss. And I found that fascinating, a strange symptomless disease, surely some spots on the leaves or something, but nothing. That was the very first time I heard of return stunting disease. And then my honest supervisor said, well, you could apply for that. So I went down to the Harwood hot water treatment tanks. And the extension officer there at the time was Dr. Bob Aitken. He was recently appointed as the extension officer and he was hot water treating cane. We hot water treat cane to control return stunting disease. 50 degrees for three hours, that removes this bacterial infection to the tune of about 95%, so it cleans up the, the cane a little bit. And Bob helped me with my PhD scholarship application and I remember thinking at the time, what a job. This must be the best job in the universe, doing what Bob's doing. Um, while I'm just on these hot water treatment tanks, a lot of people in the industry think that hot water treatment was developed against return stunting disease. It wasn't. It was developed by one of my heroes, Gerharda Wilbrink. Gerharda Wilbrink was a Dutch plant scientist who worked in East Java during the 1920s. She was the one who found that hot water treatment can help control this <coughs> new disease they had called Sera. She was the one who discovered chlorotic streak disease of sugarcane, or the fourth disease as she called it. We'll learn a bit more about chlorotic streak later. She was also the one who produced the first interspecific crosses between Saccharum officinarum, true sugarcane, and Saccharum spontaneum, which was then used by her successor, Jess Sweet, who made the modern commercial varieties. And yet, you look in the literature, you won't find, you won't find much of Gerharda, but she was formidable, a brilliant scientist, a woman in a man's world, punching well above her weight. Anyone here has heard of Gerharda Wilbrink? You have now. Welcome to Gerharda. Okay, so I did my PhD. I was enrolled at Macquarie University, but I was doing my PhD at the BSES, which is just around the corner, where Steve has also worked as well. And at the BSES, it's where I fell in love with the University of Queensland because I'd come over and drop my sequences over at the University of Queensland and I saw what a real campus looked like. The lovely sandstone, the vibrant student atmosphere, bands playing. I, th I found University of Queensland great and I've basically wanted a job at the University of Queensland since I met the University of Queensland. But I was enrolled at Macquarie and I was doing my research. What did I find? I found that the bacterium that causes return stunting disease was apparently clonal. I could go to Taiwan or Formosa I could go to Indonesia, I could go to Mali, Australia, I could go anywhere cane's grown, Brazil, Florida, and the bacterium is essentially the same, which is really quite different from most pathologies. Most pathologies, you have an arms race going on where the plant evolves defences and the bacterium evolves def uh, attacks and you have a lot of diversity. But in this case, it was apparently clonal. And that led me to believe that Saccharum spontaneum, that wild cane, was the original host. Let me show you how that works. If we take New Guinea as the centre of origin for Saccharum officinarum, and we know this through a whole lot of records, we know that that's where sugarcane came from. Throughout the 17th, 18th, 19th century, people were collecting these clones out of New Guinea to try and establish the world's sugar industries. If the bacterium was naturally associated with Saccharum officinarum, you would have seen multiple strains get distributed. I can also add that RSD was never found in New Guinea 
until it was introduced in commercial plantations and it was discovered in 2002. So we know that it can't have been originally associated with Saccharum officinarum. However, back to Gerharda Wilbrink, based at Pazurun in Java, she crossed the Saccharum officinarum with Saccharum spontaneum. And those clones basically went everywhere Cain went. And that's what I theorise is the way where we've got a single worldwide clone of this bacterium spread around the world's sugar industries. Any questions on that? Please. Probably what year are we talking now, isn't it? 1926. 1926, the clones were distributed. The crossing was done in 1921. And what markers had you thrown over to just that they were clonal? At the time, I did single-stranded conformational polymorphism of the intergenic spacer sequences. We did the rapids, so the box, the ERIC, the M13 sequencing primers. We sequenced several of the 16Ss. We actually recently, there's some genomes compared, so we've actually got multiple genomes now, and those genomes, there are some SNPs, but they're essentially clonal, which is really fascinating for a plant pathogen. Okay, what else did I find? I found that the disease was significantly underdiagnosed. It was an ELISA test based on xylem sap samples of the best cane possible. So you seed bed sort of cane. Cane that's so good that a grower wants to plant that again. I found that a non-destructive sampling could be optimised using PCR. So instead of cutting the stalks and pumping the sap, just go take a piece of it and do a DNA test on that. So I was getting that to about 30% accuracy when I finished my PhD. And I also developed Leifsonia generic primers that couldn't just detect Leifsonia xylai, subspecies xylai, but it would pick up any number of Leifsonia. I remember having a big argument with one of the pathologists at the time at the BSES who said, why would you want primers that pick up all the Leifsonia? And I said, well, the thing is, if we've got an acquisition of a disease, an uh, infectious agent that's causing a major disease, what's to say there are not other strains out there that could pose a bit of a threat to our industry, but are invisible to our modern diagnostics? He couldn't understand that, but I developed these primers anyway. Um, and I found that resistant varieties were the best hope. I had no idea at the time that this one point would be met with such industry resistance. At the same meeting, we had the head breeder, Mike Cox, we had the head pathologist, Barry Croft, arguing till they were blue in the face that RSD was already under control, so we didn't need resistant varieties, it wasn't worth it. We still haven't had a cost-benefit um, relationship done on that, and I might sort of touch on RSD resistance later on in the talk. So what did I do then? Finished my PhD, I flew to Ireland. You remember that girl I was writing to from Skibbereen? She was then doing her nursing degree at the National University of Ireland, Galway. And I thought, well, I'm a clever chap. I'm going to get myself a job at the National University of Ireland, Galway. Uh, they had a lovely program looking at marine algae, cyanobacteria, genetic analysis of that, population dynamics. Yep, I can do that. Put an application. The bloke said, the top of the pile. And I waited and waited and waited for an interview. In the end, didn't get an interview. Found out much later that it went to another lecturer's son. And that happens too often in science. So what did I do in the meantime? My first postdoc was cutting sandwiches in a delicatessen in a service station in Galway. And I did that for about three or four months. And I tell you what, I can make a sandwich. <laughs> I don't know what you guys have had for lunch, but I reckon I could top it. My second postdoc, Bricky's Labourer in Skibbereen. When I say Bricky's Labourer, they don't use bricks, they use big blocks, and they were heavy. And I was doing that for a little while as well. I come out looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger, without the looks, but um, it was heavy work. And I was doing that for a little while. In the end, I thought there's no opportunities in Ireland, so I'll come back to Australia. In Australia, I got a job as a Bricky's labourer. That was my third postdoc. Instead of keeping bricks up to one person, I was keeping up to uh, three qualified Brickies plus a uh, third year apprentice. And it was hot work, my goodness. So what I did, after about four months of that, I bought my first car, which was a 1983 Ford Meteor, $450 worth of grunt, and I whizzed up the coast with that girl from Skibbereen, looking for jobs, knocking on doors, trying to find a start in science. I got as far up as Cooktown, and on the way back, I was asleep in the car when she drove through Mariba. Had I been awake, I might not have applied to get the job as the DPINF bacteriologist based in Mariba. But I was so glad I did. Because in this job, I looked at a diversity of different presentations caused by bacteria. 
and fungi and viruses, but I was focused on bacteria. And I remember in the first few weeks of the job, a farmer would come and say, what's wrong with this? And I'd say, well, what is it? Oh, that's a rambutan. Okay, now I know what a rambutan looks like. Uh, and it was a really steep learning curve because in the Atherton Tableland, they can grow basically anything with the exception perhaps of rhubarb. So I could look at any plant disease on any crop with the exception of sugarcane. I wasn't allowed to touch sugarcane. So I could look at, for example, we've got some tomato speck caused by a pseudomonas over here. I discovered a lovely bacterial blight of golden cane palms after Cyclone Larry came through. This one here, you can just about smell that, can't you? Yeah, that was um, Pectobacterium, horrible stench. It's actually a highly evolved process that prevents you trying to eat it. This presentation here, anyone know what this one is? It's on peanut. Best name of any plant disease I know, it's called funky spot. And it's not even a disease, it's physiological as far as we know. So I got a really good grounding in a lot of different presentations and I also got to travel a fair bit with my work. So um, with Roger Chavas, who, who um, Alice had mentioned, I was doing uh, in Thailand some presentations, workshops on how to identify bacteria. I went to Uganda and I met this, uh, this bloke's a witch doctor. Um, I got to meet a witch doctor. Now that's something I never thought I'd ever do in life. Um, went to Uganda and checked out some banana diseases there. This is in the Philippines working on a papaya disease. So these papaya are all basically being destroyed. Um, and I got to really enjoy teaching and instruction and bringing someone from a position where they don't have knowledge to where they can go and do a PCR or they can sequence something, they can work out what something is. And I, excuse me, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, at that time, I was doing some work in the Philippines and on an ACR project, trying to control bacterial wilt. And that was really rewarding work because you have a situation where you have this horrible wilted potato which is of no value to the farmer and based on your interventions, based on the knowledge that you impart, the same farmers can grow a good crop. What does that mean for that farmer? That farmer can send his daughter to school. That daughter can get an education. That daughter can go and do whatever chances that the world offers her. And that's, that's why I think plant pathology, that's one of the real values in plant pathology because you can make a difference. Um, it taught me a lot about integrated pest management. It also taught me about personal security. I was in southern Mindanao, which is uh, basically, if you looked at the DFAT website, it said do not travel. Um, we at one stage had a SWAT team <laughs> associated with us. That was really good fun. I said, there's only two of us, there's six of you. You have not seen half of us. <laughs> They're all hiding in the bushes with the big guns, you know. Would you like to shoot this gun? No, <laughs> no I don't want to shoot this gun. Um, that was a real experience. So, in terms of trying to control wilt, we have to do rotations. Okay, they grow cabbages, and then the diamondback moth moves in and starts chopping them up. So that taught me about integrated pest management. How do you line up those ducks? It also taught me about cutting through with extension. On my trips to the Philippines, I found a couple of things. I found that the women did most of the work, and the men did very little work. They pretended as if they were busy, but the women were doing the work, and they loved what they call green jokes. We'd call it a blue joke. So we had a whole extension series of cartoons which I designed and had translated um, talking about droopy stalks for example and how to prevent getting droopy stalks and the women love this and so they'll be sharing it among themselves and we had really good buy-in. Now if the farmers didn't find it funny I, I certainly did. <laughs> um, I think this was just after one of them offered me a shot with the gun and I said no man, no I can't do that. A really good experience again. Then I moved to Brisbane so I had three years in Mareeba and there was a secondment as a molecular taxonomist working out of the Brisbane Herbarium with Roger. That's where I met Alistair. That's where, we are actually at Indrapilly at the time and that's where the first backwards gel went. Uh, don't worry Alistair, I've run many backwards gels in my time. Uh, I do it at least once a year just to refresh my memory. Um, and we're doing molecular characterization of novel pathogens. So a lot of it, this is Roger's sort of thing, it was, um, I call it spots on leaves. And I may have been can I say the P word? I might have been taking the P a little bit. Um, these fungal plants come out with a lovely picture. In this one we have grasses with unknown beetle. <laughs> Where it was collected, it wasn't even the normal host. But we just want to get a pretty picture in for the fungal planet. Um, I was also doing ad hoc bacterial identifications at the time. You know, someone comes in and says, oh, you're the bacteriologist. And I wasn't officially the bacteriologist, but can you identify this? Yeah, I can. Okay, I can do that. At that stage, I did the strawberry angular leaf spot incursion. So at Bundaberg, some germplasm came in. It started expressing angular leaf spots. It's a bacterial disease. It's a quarantine pathogen. 
Um, and actually a very difficult pathogen to work on because it's very slow growing, like the return stunting disease organism. And it's also, basically, if you're a strawberry, you'll get any number of bacteria on your leaves. So it can be a hard one to isolate. But we got through that. And then I had a fateful conversation. I remember I was down in the bottom of uh, Indrapilly, and Ken Pegg and Jay Anderson cornered me about pineapples. At that point, there was an import risk assessment for bringing Malaysian pineapples into Australia. And at that point, they said that this bacterium, a Winnia chrysanthemum, we've already got present in Australia. It occurs on sugarcane, it occurs on bananas, it occurs on potatoes. And so they asked me, can I, can I look into this? Eventually, after much badgering over weeks, I agreed to look into this. And this is a very fateful conversation for me. And I, I just gave a talk recently in Boston called The Rough End of the Pineapple. I just had to get that one in as well. OK, so what happened? So Daff initially said that the thing's already present. So we can bring the semi-processed fruit in from Malaysia. It makes no difference at all. I should just mention, speaking of Malaysia, there's my Malaysian friend. Hey, Amar, you're just in time. Sorry, uh, no, you are all right, mate. Um, in Malaysia, you have this disease called ghost rot. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting soft rotting bacterium that actually invades via the flower. And so the bacterium, insects come to visit the flower, the bacterium moves down to the plant and it starts fermenting that plant. And that's producing gas. And then over night time when the workers are walking home from the fields, some of this gas is escaping from the pineapple going And they thought it was haunted, so they called it ghost rot. Now, we do have soft rotting presentations on pineapples in Australia, but we don't have that specific pathogen because this specific pathogen was quite different. First of all, a Winnie chrysanthemide doesn't exist. It was originally a Winnie chrysanthemide, then it got changed to Pectobacterium, and now it's Indicia. Completely different pathogen. The Malaysian strains are epidemiologically, biochemically, and genetically distinct. And we know this from our Malaysian colleague, Lim, who has done all the work on this. And he's writing to us saying, don't let them in because you'll otherwise get this disease. Like what happened in Hawaii. You will bring this disease in. Don't do it. We also, Ken Peg and I, we also said that the import conditions would result in harm to the Australian pineapple industry. We said that. We gave that to Biosecurity Australia, who said, no, nope, it's a Winnie chrysanthemum. It's the same as Australian strains. No evidence provided. Just some Muppet in Canberra typing an email, it's easier to say it's already here. So what did we do? We disputed this finding. And we said, no, you're wrong. Look at this evidence. Look at this scientific evidence. You're wrong. And we gave it back to them. And they said, no, nah, it's the same. And that's when another fateful decision happened. Ken and I offloaded our dossier of information to the pineapple industry. Pineapple industry gave it to Biosecurity Australia, and my friends, that's when the excrement hit the overhead cooling device. <laughs> that's when a series of emails that were leaked to me said, basically amounted to how are we going to punish Anthony. The punishment at that stage was to send me back up to Mariba to replace the woman who I'd put into her job as the bacteriologist, kick her out of her job with her two kids at school, and do that job again. Now, I'm never been forwards about going backwards. And so I basically told them to jump in the lake, <laughs> as it were. And so I left, so what am I going to do? I got a job in Melbourne, lined up with Aquis, teaching plant protection, diagnostics. OK, I could move to Melbourne. At that stage, my wife, that little skibbereen girl, I tell you about that skibbereen girl. <coughs> she was my wife at this stage, and she was six months pregnant. My mum had been diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, so you know, I wasn't keen to sort of move too far away. Um, what do I do? So I rang up my old man, tell him, Dad, I'm going to move to Melbourne. And he said, oh, hold on. He said, you hear that Dr. Bob has retired. Dr. Bob, the bloke who helped me with that PhD scholarship application. So I rang up the BSCS the next day. No, the job's closed. It shut yesterday. Like, oh no. I said, can I get an application in? He said, what makes you think you'll get the job? This is for an extension officer in Harwood. I said, well, I'm a cane farmer's son from Harwood Island. I've got five years experience in DPI with extension and I've got a PhD in return stunning disease. He said, get an application in. And so I got the job. In the meantime, I started writing my book, Bent Bananas. It's gonna be on shelves as soon as my kids are old enough to feed themselves and 
I can finish off with, we've got about 60,000 words. This is where a genetic engineer goes rogue and makes uh, bananas express tetrahydroxycannabinol. And there's an underground <laughs> trade in these bent bananas. I just want Peter Jackson to read it, turn it into a film and make me a million dollars. That's all I want. This is another one of my get rich slow schemes. Okay. Just after I started as an extension officer, there was a inquiry, a Senate inquiry into the pineapples from Malaysia debacle. And it recommended that the government ensure Australia's import risk analysis process is consultative, scientifically based, politically independent, la da 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 da. There's 24 recommendations. One of them was it review its assessment about Dickia, which it had to. And the other one, and this is really important, and this goes for any young scientists out there, this is going to help because the full reasons and relevant supporting documentation has to now be provided. And that's really important because it's very easy for someone in Canberra to say, no, it's not a problem, you're wrong. But now they have to justify their decision and that's going to help. That was a good outcome. Okay, so I moved back to Maclean. I was born in Maclean. My father's cane farm at Harwood Island, that's where I was actually based. And I, I thought at that stage, well, this is me and science. I walked away from science. I said, there's only one way I'll ever get back into science, and that's through some two-bit regional agricultural university. I can't do science anymore. I'll be an extension officer. But in saying that, I thought, this might give me a chance to do some unfinished business with that return stunting disease, which I've got a little picture of over here. But soon, because we had a lot of flooding years, we had uh, January flood in 2011, 2012, 2013. S flood spread this new disease, this chlorotic streak. Not new, 90 years old. Guhada discovered that. I soon found that there was a hell of a lot of this chlorotic streak around. And also, I just put this in for Alistair, who did his PhD on smut. So there's a sporosaurium for you, Alistair. There's a fair bit of sugarcane smut as well. That and everything else. We control variety adoption, drainage, fertilisers. I never had to write a fertiliser report before. I never had to shoot levels to put in a drain. But I learned all this on the job. And again, Bob Aiken spent a lot of time making sure I was up to speed. So the first thing I thought I could do scientifically is actually work out what the varietal susceptibility to chlorotic streak is. Because at that stage, we didn't have it. There was about 18 susceptibilities listed in the BSES speed net. And most of those varieties weren't grown anymore. So how do we assess that? We went into the mother plots and the ASPs. So mother plots are where we hot water treat the cane we grow up. They were all underwater. And so every variety had a chance to pick up the disease, this waterborne pathogen. And by doing that, we could generate ratings for the different varieties. So we could tell a grower, whatever you do, don't grow Q244 or Empire because if you do that, you'll probably cop chlorotic streak in a wet year. But 232 is pretty good, so this is very valuable information. At that stage, BSES then jagged, jagged a PCR amplicon associated with CSDs. At the very end of a three-year project looking at Ramu stunt as well as chlorotic streak, <coughs> there was no work really done on chlorotic streak, but in the end, I think Kathy Braithwaite got some primers targeting an old mice and get this amplicon. Great, okay. That's a chink in the armour. This is how we're going to solve this 90-year-old mystery. So, and I see Caroline's here as well. Um, I submitted to SRDC, which used to be the RDC for sugarcane, now it's SRA altogether, a project to do next generation sequencing analysis. At the same time, BSES submitted one to do genome walking. SRDC would fund one project, but not both projects, and that meant we had to work together to try and identify the putative oomycete. Now at that stage, between 2011 and 2013, using that genome walking approach, approximately 1,300 bases were sequenced. I was convinced that that would never work, and I'll show you why in a short moment. And I thought, we need to get next generation sequencing into the game. And so I guess I kept pestering SRDC to keep the next generation sequencing funded, because we needed that to try and solve this. Why did I think, uh, I also planted a um, seed bed of that a highly susceptible variety on my dad's farm. I, I got a few rows, so I had some material to work with. Why did I think it was gonna work? If it wasn't our my seed, and there's our chromosome, if that's a sequence that was basically jagged, if we do genome walking, it might be a long way away. You might not be able to genome walk all the way to a diagnostic locus, something that's going to help you identify this thing. 
Also, that 1,300 bases would represent 0.03% of a small chromosome of a 28 million base pair genome, which was at that stage the smallest known oomycete genome. The other thing is, diagnostic loci could be on any number of those chromosomes. And that's why I was convinced this wasn't going to work. The rate of progress was really slow. It was on average 1.2 bases per day. To put that into perspective, if it's a standard OMIC with a 100 million base pair genome, then that's 228,154 years, which is a long time to wait. If it's as small as it's only 63,000 years, which still is a fairly long time to wait. You might get microsatellites, secondary structures, other things you might get in the way. And I remember um, talking to um, Bianca Cairns and Barry Croft and I said, it's like setting off on a road trip around Australia while a moped, uh, on a moped while the Ferrari's in the garage. So in the end, after a year and a half of that project, swapped over to next generation sequencing, using samples that I grew on my father's farm, we got the identity of that organism. So now we know what causes chlorotic streak. Only 90 years in the making. Okay, I also did some work on return starting disease. I'm going to skip through this in the interest of time. I'll just say that I developed a system whereby you could go to the leaf sheath, take a sample, and that sample has these little vascular bundles present, and the bacteria that cause RSD are present in these vascular bundles. So if I cover them with water, the bacteria seep into the water, and then I can concentrate them using a centrifuge. And I can use this directly as template for PCR. One thing my PhD taught me is, unless you have specific downstream applications you need for your DNA, don't bother doing DNA extractions on bacteria. Just pop them in a PCR tube, and you get all the DNA you need. And so what we did is part of a, it was an SRA-funded project. We went to 100 different sugarcane varieties, fields, we extracted the xylem sap as per the standard ELISA protocol. Then we took a little aliquot of that xylem sap. So the little aliquot we used just for PCR, conventional PCR, not even real time. Then we did our 50 leaf sheath biopsies and we did a conventional PCR as well as a qPCR. And what did we find? We found that in our 100 varieties using the industry standard technique, we had three fields were infected. 3%, great. RSD is less than 5%, great, 3%. When we tested exactly the same xylem sap using PCR, we found that 12 fields were infected. When we did our LSB PCR, conventional PCR, we found 18. When we did our LSB PCR, we found those 18 again, plus another nine more. So we know from this that the LSB PCR or qPCR is going to detect a lot more RSD. And if we just relied on the industry standard, it would be very easy to say that RSD is under control. What could I do in the meantime? We needed boots on the ground to try and fix this problem at Harwood. There was a lot of people who wouldn't grow, um, get clean seed because it cost too much money or they couldn't get it in time, they didn't have the right varieties. So what we did is we got through that. We made the biggest clean seed plots in the history, in Australian sugarcane history, the biggest clean seed plots. We streamlined our varieties. We made preferential variety recommendations based on variety of susceptibility. If a farmer had a problem with RSD, we'd give them more resistant varieties. All things being equal, go the more resistant variety. We purchased a dedicated harvester. We built a triple tipper that would get the clean seed out to the farmers. Massive campaign on extension and we used the new RSD diagnostic that I developed, which allowed us to detect more RSD in the seed beds so that farmers aren't planting out infected material. What happened? We had a lot of change. In 2011, when I started, this was the harvest figures. 2014, the year after I moved, the year before I moved, we had a 35% change in the variety that were growing on the river. We found that we were moving a lot more clean seed than ever before. After the success of the 2013 season, the mill managers jacked up the prices and so demand dropped a little bit. We found that growers who normally get their bundles of cane, that proportion dropped significantly. And now, pretty much, if we take it out to 2018, the growers are just getting billets, which means they can plant more of their land to clean seed. And so you can have a better impact against this disease. What were the results? 
Apart from 1962, which is way off the thing here where a lot of virgin country came into propagation, in 2015 we had the highest yield recorded on the Clarence River. Our one-year-old component was higher than the Burdekins tonnage. So we really improved the yields. If we take 2016, these are the two highest yields on record. If I take the 2017 figures, which I haven't presented, the three highest years on the record. So if you monster RSD with the best control that you can, you get record yields. Simple as that. And I want the whole industry to enjoy those yields. And we can get that if we have resistant varieties to this disease. If we look at Broadwater, which is the next closest area to Harwood that didn't have the RSD control methods, Harwood's yields, after we implemented our system, completely outstripped them. What else did I find when I was down there developing my test? As I predicted in my PhD thesis, I didn't think it was going to happen in sugarcane, but we found a whole lot of these leaf sonia in sugarcane. These are not leaf sonia zoli zoli, but other leaf sonia. And they're in Indonesia as well. We don't know what they're doing. I've got one in culture, We're trying to do Cox postulates. Some of them could be a whole new genus of bacteria. The question I have, and I've got a, uh, an SRA research project on this, is to work out whether or not these could potentially be causing YCS. They certainly are uh, yellow canopy syndrome. They certainly have to be excluded as potential pathogens. And I didn't want to end up like this. That's still Steve Pilcher. I didn't want to grow a big beard growing sugarcane on the Clarence. So I got a job at the University of Southern Queensland. What do you think of that? It took me two weeks at USQ before I realised that the motto was a phoenix. And I thought, well, there you go. That's appropriate. I've, I've drawn myself out of the ashes. I'm doing science again. And it's funny how there's a lovely poetry that goes through life. I was in the job about two months when this new disease of pineapples turned up in the Glasshouse Mountains. No one knew what it was. They sent it to the DPI or DD or DAF bacteriologist who could take it to decay, but she perhaps didn't have the molecular capacity to take it much further than that. So it came to me at USQ. And I thought, well, that's delightful. I left science because of this bacterium. I joined science again and the bacterium is waiting for me. <laughs> okay, and they're, they're, it's, not, it's not the Malaysian strains. It's a different strain after all. But that doesn't change the fact that I really enjoyed the poetry of that. Okay, um, during my time at USQ, I got to go to Indonesia, where this is me standing in Gerharda Wilbrink's laboratory. I couldn't believe my luck. And in Indonesia, we trained the scientists there how to do the LSB PCR so they could diagnose disease in Indonesia. And that was a real joy to me. My current work, <clears throat> I'm actually a course coordinator at UQ now in SAFs for integrated pest management, plant protection, biosecurity. Can you believe it? I'm actually teaching biosecurity now. <laughs> I can't get over that. I still pinch myself. Uh, plant and environmental health. I'm also teaching into five other courses, so including pasture science, agronomy, first year agronomy, other courses that need someone to teach a couple of modules for them. Because <coughs> I really enjoy teaching. I really love uh, particularly the students who are struggling a bit, bringing them up. You know, the smart students probably know more about the subject than you do. Um, but the ones who are struggling a bit, they're, they're the ones I like trying to help. I've got research interest in mung bean pathology. So this is tan spot of mung beans. I'm working with the mung bean breeder to assess the different varieties of mung bean for tan spot susceptibility. My PhD student based at QUT is working on halo blight susceptibility of mung beans. So what we want to do is integrate these so we get varieties that are resistant to both of them. As you guys pro are probably aware, with a fungal disease, like a powdery mildew for example, you can spray it, but with a bacterium you can't. So we need resistance. Still doing work on the sugarcane epidemiology. I've actually got uh, SRA Travel and Learn that I need to work on to go to New Guinea. I want to go to New Guinea to untouched areas away from commercial sugarcane plantations to see whether or not these other leaf sonia are present there. Is it possible that these leaf sonia could have somehow evolved with Saccharum officinarum? Because if we don't know what's on the horizon, we can't protect our industries. And this is something I think next generation sequencing is going to give us. Greater insights into the microbiomes of plants before we use them for breeding. Before we risk bringing in new diseases. Doing some work on pasture dieback. Has anyone, put your hand up if you've heard of pasture dieback. 
Okay, there's a few of you, but most, for those at home, most of the room hasn't put their hand up. This is one of the most devastating things I've ever seen. I don't even know if it's a disease. I, I'm sure, I'm sure it's a disease. But it attacks heaps of different grass species, native, imported grasses, no link to soils, a few links to moisture. Um, it's right around Queensland. It's currently affecting about 35,000 hectares. This is a major cookie. And we don't know what's causing it. So we've got three or four little research projects ticking away in the background on that. Also doing some work on psyllid taxonomy. As you might recall, psyllids are the vectors of Huang Long Bing, which is citrus greening, as well as zebra chip and other things. There's every chance that we have unknown Librobacter diseases that we haven't identified yet. So I'm doing a bit of work on that too. Some biofumigation, some hybrid dynamics, some tomato canker, and of course, my favourite topic of all, human evolution you really got to know where you come from if you want to know where you're going. The greatest life lesson I can impart to anyone, this is me on a Filipino John Deere, as it were, a carabao, always try to enjoy yourself. Thank you very much for coming to my talk. <laughs>